Mobile Suit Gundam, a show about the horrors of war. And also how awesome it can be. Look at these giant robots fighting each other. In space! But as toyetic as it was on the surface, the original Gundam introduced a complex setting. The Universal Century and the One Year War, set sometime in the future when humans have migrated into space colonies. Their focus is on the Principality of Xeon trying to gain its independence from the Earth-based Federation. You keep it on a tight leash. The opening narration guide does a better job of summing it up, although he sounds like he's in a rush here compared to how he sounded in the show. People were horrified by the atrocities that had been committed in the name of independence. Anyway, this is Gundam Federation vs. Xeon for the PlayStation 2. I'm also told it's on Dreamcast. Somewhere. Amazingly, not only was this released in English, unlike the other two Gundam games I've reviewed so far, but it was actually released in Europe. You don't even need to import this one. A rare sight indeed on this channel. This was during that time when they actually bothered to release these things over here. Unlike these days where they just leave you to get the English subtitled Chinese version from PlayAsia. This game has you on the front lines of the One Year War. Which side you fight for is up to you. It was originally released in the arcades, but this console release, labelled Deluxe, includes a hefty campaign mode. It includes most of the memorable missions from the anime. Odessa Day, Jabro, and the final battle at Abawaku. There's also a lot of filler missions that don't really have any plot. The missions range from standard kill everything, defend an allied ship, or destroy a Xeon mobile armor. The objective never really strays from these three, but the rules tend to differ. Sometimes respawns are allowed if you die, sometimes they aren't. It depends if the mission gives you battle strength, which will deplete if an ally dies. And trust me, it won't be you depleting the battle gauge. It'll be your idiot AI companions. The game even seems to be aware of this, since an AI respawn costs less than your own. This is a deeply flawed campaign for a lot of reasons, the least of which is the gameplay, but we'll get into that later on. It goes on for far longer than it should. There's about 200 missions, and very few of them are actually important. There's also very little in the way of story. The story from the anime is there, but it's shoved into the background, almost as an afterthought. Why does it feel that way? Well, you're not actually playing as Amuro in the Federation campaign, nor are you playing as Shah during the Xeon campaign. You're nothing more than a nameless grunt. This quickly became my biggest problem with the game. I mean, we don't always have to see the story from the same perspective. It's such a rich universe that you probably could make a story out of some of the less important characters. In fact, other Gundam media has done just that. Gundam 0080 looked at the war from the perspective of a kid. Eve Team followed an outfit of soldiers in the jungle. The problem with this game is that it doesn't try any of that. You're not Amuro, but Amuro will frequently be in the battle doing something much more important. He'll be speaking to the crew of the White Base and having dramatic scenes with Shah. You get Lala involved, Shah. You know she wasn't meant to be a warrior. All the things a protagonist should be doing. But what are you doing during all of this? What is Ensign Snickety's place in this story, exactly? Well, he's there, he blows up Zaku's, and nobody ever gives him any credit. In fact, this game gave me quite a bit of resentment towards Amuro. He usually comes at the end of missions and steals all the thunder. Yeah, but did you see how I destroyed that Zaku? I blew its head clean off. It was awesome. D don't I get any credit? I have been fighting alongside you this entire war, but none of you even know my name. That armor kid sure is something, but it would be nice if I got a medal or something. Just a pat on the back? Maybe maybe just some acknowledgement. Please? Oh, screw you guys, I'm defecting to Xeon. Is this game trying to convey what it's like not being the Gundam pilot in these stories? Because quite honestly, that doesn't make for a compelling story. You might as well be playing as Kai. But even he does stuff in the story. And at least characters actually acknowledge his existence. It's a little better in the arcade mode. Mainly because of Sailor's brief words of encouragement. I'm counting on you. Hashtag, Sailor is best girl. My long tangent aside, the campaign mode just isn't very good. You slowly build up an arsenal of mobile suits as you progress through the story. You start out with a shitty gym, because that's why I play a Gundam game. To be that nobody Shah kills in two seconds. You unlock the gun cannon, gun tank, the ground unit Gundam from Eighth Team. I'll take any Eighth Team references I can get, thank you very much. Before finally, right near the end of the game, you unlock the RX-78. Doesn't really make any sense though, since you'll be fighting alongside Amuro, also in the RX-78. You can also choose an ally to bring into battle. I usually give them the shitty gym or ball, but that's up to you really. The game tries to do something interesting with damaged mobile suits here. Any damage sustained in battle will be visible in the mobile suit deck, and carries over into the next mission should you decide to use it. You'll have to wait a couple missions for it to be repaired until it can be deployed at full health again. It encourages you to switch to different mobile suits and mix up your playing style. This was actually something I liked. 
Until you unlock the RX-78. At that point, I found myself just sending the gym on suicide missions just to speed up repairs on Gundam. This game also confused me with its difficulty. It actually tells you the difficulty of missions, but I have no idea how they're measuring these. This mission has the difficulty of normal. And it was insanely hard! You have to take out a mobile armor with no allies, all while being outnumbered by Zakus. I found this mission impossible, but the game did give me two missions to choose from. The other was labeled hard, and it was insanely easy. The difficulty is a lie. The ending of the Federation campaign is total trash too. The final mission has you trying to destroy Cassilia's ship before it takes off. Uh, that's not how that happened, game. We all know how that actually went down, because it was one of the most awesome things ever committed to animation. And then the game just ends. No cutscene, just credits and the voices of the white base crew escaping, reminding you one last time how unimportant your role in the war actually was. The Xeon campaign is more or less the same thing with some different cutscenes. I didn't play the entire thing, so that's why this review is focused more on the Fed campaign. Personally, I'm just not a fan of the Xeon mobile suits. The Zakus are awesome, but the rest are pretty ugly. All of these flaws could be forgiven if the gameplay was at least good, which it isn't, really. I can see the appeal of this, especially if you were playing in the early 2000s, but it hasn't aged well. It has 360 degree battles against multiple enemies, something the PS1 games were smart to avoid. The gameplay is simply too sluggish and unresponsive for these fast paced battles. It feels like the mobile suit is always one step behind what I actually want to do, which was a complaint Amro made about the Gundam in the show, funnily enough. Double tapping any direction will give you a quick evade with your thrusters. It's your only means of not getting your face blown off. You can even do it in the air while jumping. This is very hard to do with the analog stick, so I recommend playing with the D-pad. This could have been good if you weren't getting overwhelmed by multiple targets constantly. You can switch your target with a circle button, but it only responds like half the time, leading to many infuriating moments. The enemies also get staggered into invincible frames too, so if you knock them down, you have to wait for them to get back up to finish them off. At this point, you should switch targets to someone else so you're not wasting ammo, but this usually ends with you getting shot in the back. It really brings down the effectiveness of weapons such as the bazooka and cannon. I found myself using the machine gun a lot just to avoid staggering the enemies. Enemies should not have invincible frames. I have a feeling this is here for two-player mode, so it's balanced, similar to most fighting games. But in the single player, just let me nuke the enemies while they're KO'd, come on. It really takes the fun out of the gameplay when I have to worry about arbitrary video game rules. Same goes with the friendly fire too. <laughs> just why? Why did it need to be here? Okay, it's my fault if I bazooka Kai in the back. Alright, I can deal with that. But the game will do it to you as well, and there's nothing you can do about it. Also, if you think you can beam saber someone before they get back up, you're in for a bad time. The beam saber duels are so dangerous in this game that you're better off not even bothering with them. Whenever I went in for melee, it was always me on the losing end. You have to time it perfectly, something you're not able to do when, again, you're being swarmed by multiple Zakus. The space battles introduced even more problems, such as these annoying barriers that force you to turn around, leaving you open to enemy fire for a few seconds. Unlike the land missions, they don't give you any indication of where they are, so you will be caught in these things. I can't even tell where I am in these missions most of the time. It's only when you have a frame of reference, like a battleship, that you know where you are. These are problems that are inherent to space battles, I know, but it was never a problem in the one-on-one -on -one Gundam games. It's these constantly switching camera angles that threw me for a loop. The gun tank just looks wrong in space. It looks wrong flying too. It looks wrong any time it's not on the ground, is what I'm saying. So anyway, the gameplay isn't that good. It seems like it's trying to capture the slower pace of the first Gundam, over what the series would later become, with the mobile part of the title having a little bit more emphasis. I wish they could have handled it better though. I'm not saying it should play like those Dynasty Warriors games. That's too far in the opposite direction. But it could at least feel like I'm not controlling a tank on legs. Finally, I wanted to mention the bizarre soundtrack this game has. I've noticed with games based on anime, there are only two possibilities with the music. It's either painfully generic new music that tries and fails to capture the original music, or it is the original music. This game opts for the latter. Those sweet 70s vibes, gotta love them. I do have to question their placements in the game though. The last missions of the campaign is this song playing endlessly. This is so out of place and got on my nerves fast. Okay, so apart from these weird instances, the music and sound effects are generally on point, doing a fantastic job of capturing the feel of the show. What are they saying there? Shoot? I've always wondered this. Anyway, I don't really recommend this game. If you couldn't tell from the amount of nitpickery I've been doing, it's a very meh experience all around. I've been told there are better Gundam games, but this is one of the few you can get in Europe, complete with the English dub from the early 2000s. Anyway, I've been Stickity Slice, so I'll see you later. Destroy enemy mobile suit unit. Mm, New York. New York. Well, I suppose the typo could have been worse. Mm.